Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, where whatever time you might be tuning in uh, to this, uh, the last edition actually in this half of the season of Off the Podium, where you have a chance to join me, Richard Pryor, the music director and conductor of the LaGrange Symphony and an esteemed guest. And this week, they do not come any more esteemed than my wonderful friend and colleague, great artist, Betty Biggs. Uh, Betty, welcome to the program. It's wonderful to have you here at this seasonal time of year. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor. Absolutely, absolutely for us, for sure. So normally, of course, at this time of the year, you and I are about to dive into all kinds of you know, wonderful collaborative music making, which, of course, is just one of the absolute highlights of my year uh, and the season uh, where we get to have you know, wonderful singers uh, join the orchestra on the stage for all kinds of things. It's, it's such a tradition. And, um, you know, I am so, so sad and heartbroken that we're not able to do that this year but uh it makes me realize just how incredibly important that is to me sort of creatively artistically and i'm sure that that you know those sentiments translate to Absolutely. our wonderful community so yes uh but we we will be getting back to that uh, as soon as possible Good. So, if if I may, uh, let me. Uh, I'll I'll start with the notion of how did you find your way into choral music? I've always been involved with music. I started early, actually taking piano lessons, which was part of what we did growing up, mm -hmm. and um, I found my way through school and public school and found my way into the choir room. And I liked being there. I found I had a relatively good sense of pitch and intonation. I could sing and hold a part. And so from middle school and to high school and in high school, I had a really wonderful conductor who elevated that program beyond my expectations of what a high school director should have been and he really influenced me we um we did vivaldi's gloria we did the foray requiem we did wonderful musicals and we ended up the last spring of my senior year believe it or not doing a two piano arrangement of carmina burana and we staged it and when i finished with all of that I thought this is what I want to do. This is where I belong. And so the journey really began back in the dark ages when I was in high school. <laughs> yes, but that that one that one choral director made the difference and the yes. repertoire that he offered. Mm -hmm. uh, those those are such powerful experiences. I mean, I certainly remember they are. The, you know, kind of parallel experiences uh, in high school for me. And I, I particularly remember Vivaldi's Gloria uh, yeah. for certain being one of the very first things that I, I took part in. And I think those become you know, such foundational experiences. And, you know, a common thread with uh, some other colleagues that we've talked to on the program is there's always been, you know, kind of at least one or one particular, you know, kind of person who as a director or a teacher who has really inspired them, you know, kind of in their own musical Correct. development. And it, it really seems that you know, that's, uh, that's your experience as well. And I think one interesting point was that with the Vivaldi and with the Foray, we memorized the entire thing. So mm. the performances were totally by memory and intrinsically that just became part of that musical DNA. Yeah. At yeah. that level to perform from memory those pieces. And probably I could still sing most of it <laughs> today. You know, they, yeah. they stay with you. No, absolutely. They really do. I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, you know, I've certainly had to memorize no end of things. I mean, mostly in the context of uh, you know, when I was in high school and also an undergraduate and a little bit forward, uh, you know, participating in musicals. Uh, I can't right. act to save my life, but they always need somebody. <laughs> they always need somebody who can sing. So uh, yes. that's how that that's how that happened for me. But you know, it's an interesting thing. I think um, in the American choral. Tradition, 
tradition that so many choirs do uh, you know, go to the lengths of memorizing pieces. Right. Which, of course, you know, I mean, is the distinct advantage is, as you say, it becomes part of the DNA and you never mm -hmm. really, you know, kind of forget it. And in performance, you know, you're not worrying about, am I holding the copy right. you know, appropriately or turning pages? Right. And there's a much, much deeper connection. And I have to say, at least in my you know, kind of a, a choral experience in England, we never memorized a thing. <laughs> Oh <laughs> yeah. So so you know, uh, you know we were we we never had that experience. I mean, in part, you know, I kind of grew up in a cathedral choir tradition, and so we were singing you know, like five or six right. different pieces a day. You know, for one thing, but you know, um, I, I wish we had had that experience because I think it, it makes it operate on a whole different level. You know, kind of in terms of your ownership of the music and also your experience of the music. So I, I yes. yeah, I have a real appreciation for that. And it sets a high expectation for where you go from there. Right, yeah. And I mean, my goodness, if in high school, uh, that, yes. that's where you started. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. this, this, this explains a lot to me about uh, kind yes. of the artist you are now and where you are now. Well, so it's terrific. That, those were quite profound. So yeah, yeah. I moved, moved on from there. <laughs> <laughs> sticks, yeah, sticks with you, those those early yes. experiences for, for sure. And I mean, and that's Absolutely. also great about being able to, you know, kind of work uh, you know, with younger ensembles or student choirs, student orchestras, I think that you know, you're able to, you know, kind of hopefully make uh, their experience of what you're doing one of those kind of pivotal moments. Uh, and he approached us, Richard, as really an adult choir and the rehearsals were run like an adult choir and the expectation in that choral classroom was always um, a very professional one. Yeah. So it was frustrating at times when I left and went into other programs that that wasn't always the expectation and yeah. i found that 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 difficult at times but, yeah no I, I can appreciate that but yeah. uh, you know but but wonderful that the 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 standard setting mm -hmm. you know occurred at such an early stage uh you know, in your career and also you know obviously it's it's one that you've upheld uh, because you you can hear that and see that uh, in your choral groups. Well, thank you. So absolutely. You. No, I mean, they're, they're a joy to work with. They are. Well, they love to work with you. It's been such an honor these past two years to be a part of this oh. Christmas program. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you know, uh, so I, I now have a good sense of the beginnings and yes. <laughs> a, a good sense uh, to me. Um, so, you know, in the same way that I get the occasional privilege of working with choirs in an orchestral context, I mean, you obviously also get to work with instrumentalists, uh, kind of in your you know, kind of day-to-day. Uh, uh, life as a musician and a conductor, but I'm curious, you know, what do you as a conductor find particularly special about leading choirs? There's a great sense of community, Richard, and a great sense of humanity. And when we all come together and it's working, I don't think there's anything better. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as, you know, people are sharing their souls, basically, they're sharing themselves. And to bring people after a long day's work, and they come in, and they're tired, and grumpy, and this has happened, and that has happened, and then the rehearsal begins, and it's very transformative. Mm -hmm. And as, as you work through it, that sense of community, that sense of oneness, begins to develop and it's it's quite quite a wonderful experience even when the rehearsals can be rough yeah. um, you, you walk away with something that I don't think you came in with and that has always been to see the the faces of my singers and I'm a community choir director so I have multiple ages multiple skill sets that I deal with but to see their faces and to see kind of their souls mm. revealed 
right. while making music and making choral music. I don't think there's anything more wonderful. I don't think there's anything more personal that you can share than that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, a couple of things you know, sort of strike me there uh, in, in your answer. One is you know, just the incredible sort of you know, unifying factor of music that you know, transcends you know, you know kind of any age group, you know, gender, you know, what have you. I mean, that's the thing that sort of you know, connects. Everything. You know, our society is not in harmony a lot these days. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and when you bring a group of people together and you create that harmony, you're in harmony musically, socially, um, I, I do, I think it's a very profound experience. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I mean, you know, one can certainly argue, and I think would be correct, that, you know, if you're instrumentalist, if you're playing the cello, you can sort of like channel, you know, your soul or your emotions and expressivity through the medium of the instrument. But uh, w when I was talking uh, with, uh, to uh, Elisa Lyle, our principal flute right. player, um, she said, you know, one of the great things about the flute is, is that between you and making the sound on the instrument there's no kind of reed or you know sort of mouthpiece as such and so it becomes that much more personal and it's mm -hmm. sort of like wow I, you know, I'd never really thought of it or certainly you flute playing in that way and of course the natural extension of that is in terms of being a singer in a choir there's no instrument other than yourself you. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, everything that you sort of, you uh, are blessed with and you come with, and it's so individual in the same way that, of course, you know, uh, people's speaking voices are individual, their inflection, their accent and everything else, which right. you can sort of like tailor um, into the choral experience. So, yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more that it's the most sort of human of musical expressions because it's it absent, you know, kind of any external... Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of appendage as an instrument. So yeah, uh, re really wonderful, wonderful. Right. So let me go to uh, you know, something that might be of interest to uh, our listeners from a technical standpoint. Uh, again, you're looking at you know, quite often our, our joint roles of, you know, I get to occasionally conduct a choir with an orchestra, you get to use instrumentalists to support your, your singers. But what do you think the, uh, to you, what, you know, what are some of the differences between conducting a choir versus conducting an orchestra? Or do you, or do you essentially find it the same kind of approach? Well, I'll be perfectly honest in saying that I have not had lots and lots of experience conducting an orchestra. So um, the main difference is that I, first of all, Richard, you're dealing with text, mm -hmm. textural issues with a choir that you're not dealing with in an orchestra and uh, you know it, the or to me the or orchestral music is a little more abstract in that mm -hmm. sense yep. um but when you you're dealing with a choir the text is so important the shape of the face the way the vowels are formed the and all of those things that go into a good choir choral sound is quite different as far as what you're asking from the, mm. the orchestra, yeah. those kinds of things. Um, and the sound moves differently with the chorus than it does with the orchestra. Mm. So I admire you and those who are able to combine chorally and instrumentally uh, those two mediums together because it's acoustically very different. Yeah, yeah. You know, the way the yeah. sound moves and the rhythm and the beat is different. Yeah, no, that, that's a brilliant observation. I'll, I'll go back to uh, the observation that you made about the text, because of course, what you, you, you've got uh, a, an absolute narrative there, mm -hmm. or a poetry mm -hmm. that is being you know, kind of enhanced, projected, and shaped by the character of the text and also you know, kind of the the you know, the rhythm uh, of the syllables themselves and how the words are painted uh, you know, in music if they're declamatory or just very sort of you know, flowing and expressive, but nevertheless you you've got concrete imagery 
that is is you know, kind of built around and from the poetry that's being said. So as a choral conductor, you, know, you uh, I'm assuming that you would attach a great deal of importance to you know, kind of getting to an accurate projection of the, the poetic nature or the narrative nature of the words right. that are being said. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, wonderful. It's 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 an important consideration because I, I have to say, um, uh, again, you know, um, not as a conductor uh, necessarily, and certainly not in the last twenty five plus years. Uh, but you know, I had a huge amount of choral experience as a singer because uh, that was how I got into music, and then it sort of, you mm -hmm. know, went off at a tangent in composition and <laughs> conducting. Um, but you know, that that's my background, and I, I, I certainly remember singing under choral conductors for whom, on reflection, I, I'm not convinced that there was a particular you know, kind of adherence or imperative for the poetry. It was sort of like, you know, you're out of tune, you're behind the beat, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and you know, the, the words were, you know, seem to be sort of a secondary consideration. Right. And I have to say, you know, the, the, certainly by far the best uh, and better choral conductors that I've worked with or worked under as a singer have actually had that precise, you know, kind of refinement to their approach, that the text is so important. And it's not an afterthought, you know, to, to right. the notes and the chords and the texture and everything else. So yeah, that that's, yeah. And um, you know, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I've been very fortunate the last 15 years I've sung professionally with, um, an ensemble out of Columbus this, uh, mm. and worked with um, Dr. William Bullock, who was actually my um, professor in graduate school, my main mm. professor, but he studied under Robert, worked with Robert Shaw. And so mm. there is that attention to detail with the text. Mm -hmm. And that has been life-changing for me throughout yep. my whole career as far yep. as how you attend to the text and mm -hmm. how it merges within the piece as a whole right the importance of it right. um and to make sure that everything is clear and precise and then the music of course wraps into that so mm -hmm. uh it's a, been a, a really wonderful uh experience to work with someone who has been so committed to that part of mm -hmm. preparation yeah 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 no it, interesting interesting um i'll confess to you uh you 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 paid the compliment about the ability to sort of you know, like blend uh your choir and orchestra and yes indeed you know, acoustically uh, the sound does travel very differently mm -hmm. and such and i have to say most of my success certainly in our collaborations has been predicated on you've prepared the chorus so well that i've never really had to think about those things okay. <laughs> Well, good. Well, thank you. <laughs> and now, of course, I'm, I, I question myself as to if I did need to address one of those aspects, whether I would actually be as successful <laughs> doing it. But, <laughs> but I'm happy to rest on your laurels. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. But they, uh, they, they, they work, we work very, very hard on that. Yeah. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting that you measure. Uh, sorry, uh, mention uh, the Robert Shaw legacy because, of course, that's something I'm, I'm you know, uh, have been very aware of, having been in Atlanta for you know, 15 years or so now. And yeah. you know, I, I got to work uh, with the uh, ASO chorus um, you know, for a performance uh, when you know, the ASO were kind of in contract negotiations. Uh, shall we? Say? Say. And you know, as part of that experience, uh, you know, we did a uh, couple of performances of Mozart Requiem. And of course, they all have the vocal scores that are marked up from their experience. Yes. Uh, with Shaw mm -hmm. and you know, to actually sort of see one of those and just how incredibly deeply and rigorously Detail. yes uh, just how incredibly Detail. detailed that was marked up it made mm -hmm. me appreciate that work which you know, I've sung and also you know, conducted a number of times in a completely new way 
It's like, yeah. oh, yeah, this, this is just a whole different level mm -hmm. of thinking about and approaching choral music. And now I, I have like a, a first hand you know, kind of experience, at least through the medium of that marked up uh, vocal score of why the ASO chorus and why that you know, kind of particular tradition of preparation uh, and the, the associated sort of musical results are as fine as they are and why that chorus is still frankly I think one yes. of the best orchestral uh, or symphony choruses in the world. So yeah. I um, had the experience I was to say of, of working with uh, Robert Shaw um, when I was in undergraduate school um, I attended Brevard Music Center uh, in Brevard North Carolina and mm -hmm. um, Shaw came and conducted Beethoven's Ninth and had his assistant conductor come in weeks and weeks and weeks beforehand to help prepare us. And then he came mm. and we all were very, very young. And of course, as you know, the soprano line and that is treacherous yeah. and very demanding. And he got quite annoyed with the choir one day and threw the baton down and I'll never forget the quote. <laughs> he said, it's not that Beethoven couldn't write for voices. It's just that God hasn't created the voices to sing Beethoven. And he walked off for a while and calmed down and came back and we started again. So, <laughs> yes. It's 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 a bold statement and uh, there, there yes. is some appreciative ring of truth to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. I will never ever forget that quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, there are some of those fundamental quotes uh, from moments on the podium that stick with you. Yes. Way, they think. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, uh, we so we uh, you mentioned uh, Vivaldi Gloria, uh, mm -hmm. For Your Requiem, Beethoven Nine. Um, you also mentioned uh, your kind of musicals, uh, sort of in your background as well. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, you know, I'm curious uh, as a choral conductor and you're know, a great trainer of, of choirs in various choral traditions. You know, what is your favorite type of music to either prepare or perform? Oh, geez. Mm. Um, I'll be quite honest with you and telling you, I'm very eclectic as far as what I like to do. Um, I love the classical. Um, but with my community choir, I'm very varied as to what I do. Um, we have been, we have spent quite a lot of years doing um, collaborative work with other artists. Um, we have done Scottish concerts. Mm -hmm. We did one this past January for the Order of the Tartan for Robert Burns oh. celebration. Yeah. Beautiful concert. Um, I did several Irish concerts, Irish folk music, um, and collaborated with the Carl Drake Dance Studio in Atlanta, the mm. Irish dance studio there, brought in Irish dancers. Down. It was amazing. Um, I've done the American Songbook, mm -hmm. uh, pieces like that. In my choir, we do we do sing and do perform classical pieces, but I also have to balance it with things that community-wise, things right. that they would you know also enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the most meaningful concerts I've ever done, Richard, was uh, two years ago. We did a concert entitled victory and harmony hmm. songs that won the war hmm. and we did um a complete concert of music the music of around world war ii hmm. and we brought in 11 area uh veterans and had them honored oh. wow. world war ii veterans had them we had the auburn knights which is a swing band hmm big band that came in from Auburn and it was a it was a dinner concert so we had a dinner we had a 1940s style dinner yeah. um, and that was one of the most meaningful concerts that I think we've ever done is mm. songs that won the war 
-hmm. So we've done a, a wide variety. Um, we've, we've done the Foray Requiem, we've done Mendelssohn, we've done Beethoven, we've done Handel. Um, and I, I enjoy all of that. Mm -hmm. But when you get the right mix with the community choir and it all just fits, it's quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the so, Gilbert and Sullivan yeah. also we did, which <laughs> right. we just adored. It was yeah. so much fun. And talk about text. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, well, certainly on uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, it, uh, you know, at least in my uh, kind of high school and undergraduate experience, and I hope for uh, uh, some years after, you know, every single high school and every single university had a Gilbert and Sullivan society. Oh, or if they didn't, okay. they had a light opera society that was Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we did a ton of GNS, and, you know, it's <laughs> a, uh, a lot of fun and a lot of words. It is. <laughs> it is a lot of work. Speaking of diction. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yes. <laughs> but but back to you know, the the types you know, the styles uh, or traditions of music uh, that you you enjoy to you know, conduct or prepare mm -hmm. uh, for performance. That that's exactly the answer that I would have anticipated. I mean, in part because of your you know, kind of great sensitivity and respect for the you know, the the community group that you have, because I think as right. conductors, we've got to not live on our own sort of you know, cloud in the sky. We've got to address the needs of the, you know, the artistic needs and desires of the ensemble and also the audience. But, you know, I'd have to say that, you know, again, uh, looking back at my own experience in the choral tradition, I think it uh, just because, you know, there is nothing comparable in terms of the historical sweep of that tradition, you know, from plain chant right. through every historical period up to present day. I and mean, you can't do the same thing with violin music because there's right. a point where the violin didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know, from a choral perspective, uh, if you really immerse in that tradition, then you're exposed to so many different styles, uh, you know, and you know, uh, Western and non-Western for that matter, that yeah. you have to have a pretty eclectic approach and also appreciation for all of those things to actually live in that choral space. Yes, well, I guess also one of the most meaningful concerts that all of us um, agree upon is we, we give a large Thanksgiving concert the weekend before Thanksgiving. Mm. And the focus is, of course, American music. And I have a narrator who comes in and it is a merger of reflections that I have compiled, compiled and the reflection is read and then we sing that particular piece of music which underscores that particular reflection. Mm -hmm. And it is a lovely, lovely, lovely concert. And this year was especially, this past year was especially meaningful when we had the Vega String Quartet from yeah. Emory. Yeah come in and perform um, and that concert I think holds more meaning for my choir than any other concert probably we put forth during the year and the community I think as well mm -hmm. it is always well attended and it's a lovely 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 concert and celebration of a unique American holiday yeah. Uh, and one reason, Richard, I did that was because Christmas gets, as you know, in LaGrange gets so congested at times that it's hard to get everything in. And I love, have always loved Thanksgiving that season and that holiday. And so I crafted that concert around um, that particular holiday. And it, I think we're going into our 16th concert this coming year. Um, our, yeah. yeah. It's a very meaningful, very lovely concert. That's a fantastic tradition. And yeah. you know, I mean, we, we could certainly talk uh, you know, endlessly about music and meaning or music and the connectivity with the musicians or the community or the occasion, right. the power of music to you know, kind of underscore 
uh, you know, those those events and build those traditions. And also, yeah, you know, I mean, you mm -hmm. mentioned that you crafted that concert. I think what's uh, maybe we, we need to do another one of these uh, maybe after the holidays. But you know, we could talk about you know what it actually takes in terms of our thinking as conductors to craft a program. Uh, or put a concert together, or in fact a season where there's more of an arc or a, tra a trajectory of what we're trying to you know, kind of say you know, through the mm -hmm. music there. Mm -hmm. But well, so let, let me ask one final question, if, if you would uh, yeah. do me uh, the honor here. Um, you talked uh, certainly about uh, the Thanksgiving concert, and so maybe that's actually the answer. But I, I wondered <laughs> if you had in, any uh, other memorable moments that you might share in terms of your bringing choral music to LaGrange. Um, uh, and, and the region? I would have to say in answer to that question, um, the formation and the development of our West Georgia Choral Arts Festival mm. that we began five years ago. And, um, you know, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and you think, gosh, we could have a choral festival. <laughs> 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 and, and it and we did we um developed this this rather wonderful area choral festival that um was initially done um to apply for a georgia council of the arts grant mm. that's why that was it was a project grant and we decided that i had done middle school and high school uh, festivals in the past. I had a middle school honor course, honor festival that we did years and years ago here. But we collaborate, collaborated with um, LaGrange College and they were most generous in working with us, Dr. Tony Anderson especially. And we put together this festival, Richard, it occurs on um, the second Saturday in March. And we normally have had between 250 and 275 singers. I invite choirs of all kinds of all ages um, from within the West Georgia, East Alabama area. And then we have a guest clinician conductor who comes in and does the, the concert. And that has been a remarkable experience. The first time that we sang and they were all on stage and Dr. Beth Everett was the guest clinician. And that first sound came out of 275 voices and it just took the air out of the hall. It, it was amazing. It, it really was. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately this past year, we were two days from going into performance when we had to pull the plug on it, but we have had men's choirs, women's choirs. We include children's choirs. The whole idea was the young can sing all the way up to the more senior. And we have a wide variety of choirs and conductors that come in. We spend the whole day in mm -hmm. rehearsal and then put a concert on that is free to the public as part of our outreach. And it, that has been a remarkable experience yeah. to say that. Right. I mean, what an incredible event uh, mm -hmm. to build for you know just the region and for the broader choral community to come together, which you know kind of goes back to something right at the beginning of our conversation about the the capacity of choral music in particular to unite folks, you know, kind of across the entire right. spectrum in music yes. making. But a wonderful yes. occasion. That has been um probably one of the most eventful parts of this whole journey with the Coral Society. Right. That right. we've been able to sponsor that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a journey that is far from over. Uh, and we will we will be taking the stages back uh, under our Hope. control in, in due course. But uh, well, I certainly can't wait for that time. And you and I need to sort of put our heads together 
and determine uh, what exciting things we're going to be able to collaborate on uh, in the future between the symphony uh, and your wonderful singers, and we will most certainly do that. So, well, uh, in the meantime, uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. It has been for me. Thank you you so much for this (laughs) opportunity. Absolutely. So, and uh, for our listeners, um, thank you for joining us uh, this half of the season. Uh, We will be back after the holidays with a new lineup of discussions and conversations with friends uh, and colleagues near and dear. Uh, We wish you very happy holidays and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you.